So, as promised, we're going to spend this lecture looking at the application of Huckel theory to a particular system, and the system that we'll examine is the allele system, C3H5. And so, if you recall the allele system from organic chemistry, that is three carbon atoms, so I've just indicated them with a line drawing here. There's a pi system, I'm not showing the hydrogen atoms, but there's two on this position, two on this position, and one on this position. And so remember, the rules for doing a molecular orbital theory calculation are first, pick a basis set, and Huckel theory's rules for basis set are, there is a carbon 2p orbital, and here's just a depiction of that, and there's one of them on each of these three centers. So 2p on 1, 2p on 2, 2p on 3. Three 2p orbitals, one centered on each atom. And then we need to solve the 3 by 3 secular equation. So we set the secular determinant equal to zero, that defines the secular equation, and each element of the secular determinant needs to be determined. And so this would be H11 minus E times S11. But recall that by definition in Huckel theory, any diagonal Hamiltonian matrix element, or in this case resonance integral, is equal to alpha, remember that was the energy to ionize uh, an electron in the methyl radical, but it's, it's a value, and we're just using a shorthand, alpha. And so wherever I would have had an H11, or an H22, or an H33, I put in alpha. Similarly, we have a simplification that the overlap matrix, all diagonal elements are equal to 1, and all other elements are equal to 0. So here there would have been an S11, an S22, an S33. I just don't show them because they're equal to 1, but E is still there. Meanwhile, in every other term, the E would be multiplied times zero, and so it disappears. Now, the resonance integrals for nearest neighbors, so that's one relative to two and two relative to three, and by symmetry, uh, matrix elements are equal, irrespective of the order of their indices. Those are equal to beta, and beta also a specific numerical value, but this is just a, a handy shorthand for uh, recording it. So here are the nearest neighbor positions, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 2, 3. But the 1, 3 matrix element that would appear here is set equal to 0 in Huckel theory. So you would have gotten H13 equals 0 minus E times S13, and that's also equal to 0. So the whole matrix element is equal to 0. So here's the secular determinant. And if you remember Kramer's rule, uh, no relation, for solving a 3 by 3 determinant, it's the product of this diagonal times this sort of improper diagonal times this improper diagonal minus this diagonal times this diagonal times this diagonal. And so if I uh, expand that out with a little algebra, here's the product of the first diagonal, here's the second diagonal, and happily there's a zero in there. Here's the third diagonal, and again there's a zero in there, isn't that lovely? Here is minus the first diagonal, two zeros, so that term goes away. And then the second and third diagonal terms survive. So now I have a cubic equation in E. And so you see here, for instance, E comes into the third power. And here, E comes into a single power. And if you solve this equation for E, and I'll let you do it by hand if you want to, or you can just verify by plugging in these values that they do indeed work you will find that there are three roots to this polynomial equation for E. And the three roots are, let's just look at the easiest one, alpha. Alpha minus alpha would be zero cubed, and sure enough that's zero, 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 zero. Alpha minus alpha will be zero, so that goes to zero. Alpha minus alpha is zero, zero. So sure enough, the whole thing will be equal to zero. So we've just verified that this root alpha is a valid root. The other two valid roots are alpha minus the square root of 2 beta and alpha plus the square root of 2 beta. And because alpha and beta are negative values and the larger the negative energy, the lower the total energy, the lowest energy root, which I'll label E1, is alpha plus root 2 beta, and the next root up is alpha, and the next root up is alpha minus square root of 2 beta. All right, well, we needed these energies because these are the energies when they're plugged in to the system of linear equations defined here for all k. 
those energies permit me to actually find values of A that will be the coefficients for the molecular orbital corresponding to that energy. So let's actually expand out this set of linear equations. How many are there? Well, there's three, right? The number of basis functions that we're running over is three. The 2p orbital on the first carbon, the 2p orbital on the second carbon, and the 2p orbital on the third carbon. So here's my uh, shorthand way to write these linear equations, but now I'll write out each one. So I'll start with i equals 1, and I'm going to do this for the lowest energy root. So technically this would be a11. I won't actually include this here just for notational simplicity, but see the e value that I'm plugging in, all the places I need an e, here's the e, I'm plugging in alpha plus the square root of 2 beta. And so I'm just filling in uh, the appropriate values here. So this will be A1 times H11, and that's alpha, minus E, alpha plus square root of 2 beta, times S11, and that'll be 1. So you're just seeing in here the same, uh, the same values that were in the secular determinant. Here's an alpha minus E, here's a beta, and this is all zero, so that was just a beta. Here's totally zero. So these are the numbers in the secular determinant, but now wherever E appears, I've actually put in the appropriate root value of E. Now, I will let you uh, go through solving this system of linear equations yourself if you'd like to, but what you will discover is, if you add and subtract things appropriately, it must be the case that A3 is equal to A1 and a2 is equal to the square root of 2 times a1. Well, that is certainly progress, but we now have two equations in three unknowns, and of course there are infinitely many values of the three unknowns that will satisfy those two equations. However, if we go on to require that our wave function be normalized, that is the sum of the square moduli of the coefficients is equal to 1, and I could just say the sum of the squares because they're real numbers in this case, although I guess we haven't established that yet, uh, e equal to 1, then that applies the last constraint that I need in order to determine unique values of A. And in particular, those unique values, and now I will include this second subscript 1 to, to indicate that these are the coefficients that are correct for positions 1, 2, and 3 of the allyl system for the first, which is to say lowest energy root, 1 half, square root of 2 over 2, 1 half. So I can now actually write out the LCAO expression, namely my molecular orbital 1, 1 because it's the lowest energy, is equal to 1 half times basis function 1, which is a p orbital on carbon 1, plus the square root of 2 over 2 times basis function 2, plus 1 half times basis function 3. And were I to go and uh, plug in higher energy roots, I would be able to get different coefficients. I will uh, leave that exercise to you, and I'll just show you the results. The results are that for root 2, the coefficients are root 2 of, and hmm, wow, two uses of root 2 there. For the second molecular orbital, the coefficients are root 2 over 2 and negative root 2 over 2 on the termini and 0 at the central position. And finally, for the highest energy molecular orbital, 1 half, negative root 2 over 2, 1 half. So these orbitals, if I were to plot them, and I'll show you graphical pictures in just one moment, but the lowest energy orbital, shown here on this last slide, notice that all these coefficients are positive. That is, the p orbitals in question will all have the same phase uh, if we decide that positive arbitrarily means say uh, shaded phase up and clear phase down each one of these would be shaded phase up, shaded phase up, shaded phase up that defines a bonding type orbital, right? We have overlap between proper phases in this second orbital I'd have up no orbital at all and down and so that would be a non-bonding orbital because there's a node in between. And then finally, this highest energy orbital is up, down, up. So it's antibonding. So we've gotten three different orbitals. One is bonding, one is non-bonding, and one is antibonding. 
We'll also take a look in just a moment at the resonance energy associated with the pi system, the interactions in the pi system. But first, let me uh, actually now plot these orbitals. So I will indeed adopt the convention that a positive sign means I'm going to have the shaded side of the orbital up and the unshaded side down, in which case I would have my lowest energy orbital shown here roughly to scale. So remember this was 1 half and this is root 2 over 2, so it ought to be 1.4 times bigger. And it's bonding across the orbital. Here's my non-bonding orbital and here's my anti-bonding orbital. And these were the energies, alpha plus square root of 2 beta, alpha, and alpha minus square root of 2 beta associated with those orbitals. So I've plotted them on an energy scale. And now let me ask the question, what if I uh, start putting electrons into this system? So the allyl cation, for instance, would have three uh, orbitals, but it's a cation, so instead of having one electron in each orbital, there will only be two electrons, and I would probably follow an Aufbau principle that says I'm allowed to put two electrons in an orbital, so I'll put them in the lowest one. And so the net energy of the al cation is 2 times alpha plus square root of 2 beta. And so this is just words, what I just said. I'm going to use an Aufbau principle. The electrons have the energy of the orbital that they occupy, so the total energy is 2 times alpha plus the square root of 2 beta. Now, let me ask a different question. What if I had a fully localized structure? That is, what if I took my two electrons and I just put them in a pi bond between two of the carbons and I let the other carbon be a true carbocation? It's got an empty, non-interacting p orbital on the remaining carbon atom. Right? So there is no delocalization. There's a standard ethylene-like pi bond and there's a carbocation next door. What would the energy of that be? Well, we've already established what the energy of a pi bond is. It is uh, 2 times alpha plus beta. That was something we looked at in the last lecture. And what's the energy of an empty p orbital? Well, there's no electron in it, so the energy is 0. So the difference between these two energies, the delocalized pi bonding allyl system and a localized pi bond and a carbocation, is 2 alpha, we'll cancel out 2 alpha here, but here I have 2 times the square root of 2 beta versus 2 times beta. Well, remember beta is a negative number, it's favorable, and the square root of 2 is bigger than 1, the square root of 2 is about 1.4 if we truncate out to the first decimal place. So I'll have a factor of about 0.8, and to be particular, 0.83 beta, more stabilization in the Huckel delocalized owl cation than I would in a fully localized system. So resonance, the delocalization, is a favorable phenomenon in the owl cation, and it's favorable by 0.83 times beta. And you could just go back and look at how many electron volts or kcals per mole or whatever you like beta is. And when you do that, you'll see that that stabilization is 25 kcals per mole. So how might I go about it? evaluating that experimentally? How might I decide if that's a good estimate or not? Well, one way to get this localized pi bond with an empty carbocationic like orbital next door would be in fact to rotate one end of the al cation by 90 degrees. So then I would be left with a pi system here but I would have rotated this methylene such that its p orbital is in the plane of the, the drawing here, where this pi orbital is in and out of the plane of the drawing. And so it can't conjugate because it's orthogonal. And I would truly have just that hypothetical system I'm describing. Localized, double bond, empty p orbital. So given that, I ought to expect that the 25 kcal per mole resonance would be entirely lost, and perhaps the rotational barrier for the al cation is indeed roughly 25 kcal per mole. And in fact, if you do an NMR experiment, that's not a bad estimate. It's actually a reasonably good uh, 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 approximation for the rotational barrier. So, hooray, a victory for Huckel theory. Now, what if we were to consider the owl radical or the owl anion? Well, in order to think about those energies, I would add one more electron for the radical, two more electrons for the anion, 
and let me flip back two slides here, where will they go? They're going to have to go into this orbital. It's the first empty orbital, the lowest energy one. So when I put in a third electron, I'll have energy alpha added to 2 times alpha plus square root of 2 beta. And when I put in a fourth electron, I'll get yet another alpha. And so that's what I have here, that the uh, Huckel energy of the Al radical is the cation plus alpha, and the anion, the cation plus 2 alpha. And so were I to consider these rotations again, what would I get when I rotate a terminal methylene, either a radical or an anion, out of the plane? Uh, well, I would get the pi bond energy, 2 times alpha plus beta, and if it's a radical, I get alpha, because I've got an occupied p orbital. If it's an anion, I get 2 alpha, so it's an occupied anion. And so in fact, these, these sum terms, if you will, are not contributing any kind of special stabilization or destabilization. I get the same addition of alpha, whether I'm conjugated or whether I'm unconjugated. So the difference, the resonance energy, still comes entirely from this term, and it's still 0 0.83 beta, right? 2 times this quantity minus 2 times just plain old alpha plus beta. However, if you go and look at the rotational barriers for the al radical and the al anion, you will discover that those barriers drop successively, actually, until for al anion, it's nearly a free rotation, as long as you don't have a, a coordinating counter ion that's doing something to raise the barrier. So, Huckel theory begins to fail, ultimately, in describing the resonance energy in these systems. And in fact, the, uh, it, this is simply a failure of Huckel theory in a way, and it's a particular failure, namely that we're solving for these molecular orbitals with a one electron-like picture. But then we're filling many electrons into these orbitals and in a way not really accounting for the additional interactions between the electrons that will modify these orbital energies as a consequence of having more than one electron. And so that is, a, that is an issue that we will revisit uh, in future lectures, in fact almost immediately in future lectures, to think more carefully about how to deal with many electron systems as opposed to effective Hamiltonians based on one electron analyses of molecular orbital theory. All right, well, this lecture certainly offered a lot of opportunities to uh, play around a bit and make sure one is on top of details like solving the linear equations or uh, plugging in the relevant matrix elements and, and verifying that they're true. So I encourage you to take some time to do that, and once you feel comfortable with filling up the secular determinant, you will be ready for our next set of lectures which will look at semi-empirical molecular orbital theory that is more general than Huckel theory and uh, will in fact use the correct so-called Hartree-Fock equations to uh, build up the relevant secular determinant matrix elements. So, until then.